has been associated with the Indian Space Research uh, Organization for the last 38 years and has primarily carried out research towards the effective utilization of space technology for the studies of ocean, atmosphere, and climate for societal benefits. The main focus of his research has been on satellite data application for ocean state predictions, data assimilative numerical models, and algorithm development. He has played a pivotal role in progressing collaboration on remote sensing with the National Space Agency of the United States, Japan, and France. He leads the Indian science team of NASA ISRO joint mission, which is called as NISAR, which is working to measure Earth's changing ecosystem, dynamic surfaces, and ice masses, thereby providing information about biomass, natural hazards, sea level rise, groundwater, and so forth. For his exceptional contribution over the past several decades, Dr. Kumar has been awarded with numerous prestigious awards, such as the Pisharoth Rama Pisharoti Memorial Award, the Hariyom Ashram Prerit Senior Scientist Award, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai Award, and ISRO's Team Excellence Award. It is a huge honor for the National Maritime Foundation to have him enrich us all with his lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have Admiral Sunil Lamba, the chairman of the National Maritime Foundation amongst us, and I would like to accord a special welcome to him. We would be hearing his views in the end segment of today's program. Now I would quickly like to run a couple of admin instruction which we request you to follow for the smooth conduct of today's program. First, all participants except the speakers are requested to mute their mics and switch off their device cameras. Secondly, any question that you might have can be posted in the chat box and they would be addressed during the interactive session, which would be conducted in the second half of this program. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we move forward, we would like to capture this precious moment for our records. So may I request you all to kindly switch on your cameras for 30 seconds or so, so as to allow us the luxury of taking some good photograph of all the participants. And um, as you switch your cameras, please give a big smile so that, we'll, uh, that it will ensure that we have a good photograph. <laughs> I will wait for another 10 seconds because it might take some people that bit extra time. So maybe 10 seconds more. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for that. You may now switch off your respective cameras. And also, please do confirm that your audio is muted. Now, without any further ado, let us head into this first segment of today's program, wherein I request Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, to deliver opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Satyam, uh, um, Dr. Rajkumar, Admiral Lamba, our Chairman. It is sing a singular honor for all of us uh, to have both of you present on the same platform and I must also include many other people, uh, such as Dr. Ravindra and uh, Admiral Murli Dharan, and a whole host of people. If I go down that line and name each one of, of them, uh, I think that we will clean run out of time. So you will forgive me if I was to just offer you a generic welcome uh, to the National Maritime Foundation uh, on this online uh, eminent persons lecture by Dr. Rajkumar, who is the director of the uh, NSRO, which we will talk about in some detail. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is also a great privilege for us to be able to welcome our own interns and our own uh, knowledge partners, both within uh, the NMF's fold as well as outside of it. And once again, it would be churlish of me not to acknowledge uh, the huge value that each of you bring uh, to these sessions. So thank you once again. Uh, as many of you are already aware, India's OceanSat series of satellites uh, constitute a major augmentation of India's remote sensing uh, program, which is run by the Indian Space Research Organization, or as it is ubiquitously known, uh, ISRO. So OceanSat 1, 
which is also uh, known as IRS P4, was the first Indian satellite built primarily for ocean application. And this satellite was launched via India's very own uh, Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle or PSLV some two decades ago on the 26th of May in 1999, to be precise. Uh, and it was launched from the uh, Satish Dhawan Space Center at Sri Harikota in Andhra Pradesh. Just it's a barrier island, of course, as all of you know. Uh, North of uh, north of Chennai and just at the border of uh, Andhra Pradesh. So um, this particular uh, satellite launch of uh, OceanSat one actually signaled a, a massive paradigm shift in India's space-based remote sensing capability. OceanSat two uh, was launched a decade later on the twenty third of September two thousand and nine. Once again, via a PSLV and once again from Sri Harikota. Uh, and it provided continuity of operational services of OceanSat 1, but with enhanced application potential. Now, in both of these programs, one of the central figures in terms of the data application and all the, all the uh, associated data exploitation mechanisms was indeed our eminent speaker for today, uh, Dr. Rajkumar. So the payload of OceanSat 2, you know, it included, of course, a, an ocean color monitor. It is abbreviated to OCM, as had been the case with OceanSat 1 as well, and a ROSA, uh, which uh, is uh, an acronym for Radio uh, Occultation uh, Founder for Atmosphere. And that had been developed not for not by an Indian Indian firm, but by the Italian Space Agency. Uh, but perhaps most important and of particular relevance uh, to all of us here today uh, is the fact that uh, it included uh, OceanSat two included uh, a KU band pencil beam scatterometer or SCAT that had been developed in house by ISRO under the active guidance of Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, so scatterometer is, uh, or diffusion meter is really uh, Dr. Rajkumar's particular focal uh, point, if there was to be one, but the, the umbra and the penumbra that he casts uh, around him is so large that it encompasses many other applications as we will hear him uh, narrate. OceanSat 3 is already scheduled to be launched. I think it's going to happen on the 31st of October this year in 2021. And then that will provide service con con uh, continuity once again for users of the ocean uh, color monitor data from OceanSat 2, while simultaneously enhancing the application potential uh, in other areas, such as the simultaneous measurement of sea surface temperature. Now, at this point, I'm sure that our BECC cluster and its uh, adjunct uh, uh, interns would have pricked their ears up. And this is being done using, uh, that is the measurement of sea surface temperature, not the picking up of the ears, is being done using long range uh, infrared uh, sensors or LWIR sensors. In addition, of course, to uh, chlorophyll measurements and the identification of potential fisheries zones, as well as the tracking of uh, phytoplankton uh, and uh, and zooplankton or the primary producers as well. This is now going to be a global uh, uh, mission for OceanSat 3. And OceanSat 3 is uh, configured to cover, as I said, the globe's oceans as a whole and provide once again continuity of ocean color data with global wind vectors and character characterization of uh, lower atmosphere and the atmosphere itself. And I'm sure that uh, Dr. Rajkumar will tell us much more about all that. But I do want to mention one point once again, and that is within uh, Dr. Rajkumar's uh, wide ranging domain expertise, one special area of focus deals with the exploitation of data obtained from the KU band uh, pencil beam scatterometer. And what this does it, it, is that it enables the analysis of wind vector data for cyclone forecasting. And that, for all of you who are from India or the Indian region, is a 
is well known to be of critical importance and value. It also enables numerical weather modeling. Now, for the benefit of some of our younger interns, let me quickly uh, state that uh, a scatterometer or a diffusion meter is actually a scientific instrument which is used to measure the return of a beam of the light or electromagnetic uh, waves or other waves that have been scattered uh, by diffusion in a medium such as air. So uh, it's not so it's not so esoteric because optical uh, scatterometers or optical uh, diffusion meters using visible light are very frequently found at airports. You know when you're trying to measure horizontal visibility and the pilots in your aircraft tell you that uh, Delhi is reporting a horizontal visibility of X or Y units, then that is being done usually by means of an optical diffusion meter. However, what we are going to be hearing about this morning are really radar scatterometers, which form part of the payload of uh, satellites, as I mentioned, such as OceanSat 2 and OceanSat 3 in the future, and are used to transmit a pulse of, uh, of microwave energy towards the Earth's surface, and then to measure the reflected energy. Then that data, when it's downloaded, it enables scientists uh, such as Dr. Rajkumar to undertake accurate measurements of near surface winds, particularly those over the ocean. Now, traditionally, oceanic spaces have not been very well uh, mapped. And even now, uh, the world is just waking up to the complexities of trying to do accurate predictive measurements over the deep ocean surfaces. Thus far, much of our attention has been paid to coastal areas and land areas. But now, all this is of specially importance and especially uh, enormous significance, I would say, uh, to the NMF's Blue Economy and Climate Change Cluster. And Dr. Rajkumar, I must, uh, with great pride, introduce uh, them to you uh, and speak about them for about a minute or so. And I want to emphasize that this cluster is arguably at least as we speak right now, the most dynamic of the NMF's uh, research clusters, and it deals with, as the name implies, the blue economy and climate change. It is headed by Dr. Push Bajaj, who is a PhD holder in chemistry, before gravitating across to the much more seductive areas of climate change. And the cluster encompasses a, a, a wide range of subjects from, uh, from ocean governance, uh, to the impact of public international maritime law and uh, the, the mostly deleterious effects of uh, climate change upon maritime security, holistic maritime security, not just military security, but not excluding military security either, and the vulnerability of coastal urban agglomerations to climate-induced sea level rise and extreme weather events. And that's one of the reasons why I was hoping that at some point we might be able to, if not during your lecture, most certainly during the uh, Q&A, force fit uh, some of the uh, international uh, satellite um, experiments which are in progress. Uh, most notably, of course, uh, is the, is the um, gravity-based uh, measurements being undertaken by GRACE-1 and GRACE-2 for measurement of sea level rise. But also, as I said earlier, the altimeter based ones from JSON 1, JSON 2, and JSON uh, 3. Uh, and now, of course, as you know, in 2021, we have new satellites uh, such as the Copernicus uh, Sentinel uh, 6 uh, Michael Freilich satellite. Michael Freilich, uh, for those of you who do not know, was until recently the uh, director of, the, uh, of NASA's uh, Earth Sciences segment. And uh, this satellite is particularly uh, new, and so we are hoping that ISRO, with its much wanted uh, capability of uh, re not not reinventing, but but moving forward from piggyback, not piggyback riding, but leapfrogging ahead of Western uh, scientific endeavor, uh, will in fact be able to also uh, address issues of sea level rise and the ones that I've mentioned. But to come back to this uh, BECC cluster, uh, to buttress their commendable efforts, you know, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, a very good dose of applied science is critical. And this is where your lecture is likely to find the most immediate resonance. India, of course, is doing great things in space, 
and ISRO is a leader in every facet of space-based science from, from uh, PSLV rockets to satellites to their payload to the data applications. And all these are not just mere esoteric subjects. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, all of these have very significant societal implications. And as everyone in the NMF knows pretty much by heart, the core national interest of India is to assure the economic, the material, and the societal well-being of the people of India. Now, Dr. Raj Kumar is a pioneer and a champion in ushering in the societal benefits of space to the average Indian fisherman, the average Indian farmer, the average Indian citizen. And sir, it is an honor to have you with us. I cannot tell you how pleased we are that you have agreed to talk to the uh, NMF and its uh, well-wishers. And with these few brief remarks, uh, allow me to hand the proceedings uh, back to Satyam. Satyam, it's over to you. Thank you, Admiral Chauhan, for those remarks that will set the tone for the interactive session that would be following the presentation by Dr. Rajkumar. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, may I now request your undivided attention as we launch into the segment that we all have been waiting for. It is now with an abiding sense of honor that I request Dr. Rajkumar to deliver the eminent person lecture. Respected sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. And uh, many thanks to uh, Admiral Chauhan uh, because you set the tone very rightly. As, uh, and that is also true that I may not able to uh, cover each and everything. <laughs> the reason is the time is uh, this uh, short. Uh, I thought uh, uh, I will start with the some of the things uh, what ISRO is doing and then what uh, under the blue economy uh, what we, we can do or what are the number of parameters or from the uh, anyhow uh, you told many parameters uh, already uh, available from the not only from the Indian sensor but from the uh, variety of sensor all over the globe. The reason in that uh, having the cooperation in this case uh, because uh, ocean and atmosphere two things are there which are global the other things uh, when we go for the different resources i i hope you are able to listen to me or uh, and seeing my slide yes sir we can yeah thank you thank you yeah so i thought yeah i, I should yeah so yeah, because ocean and atmosphere, these two things are there, which are global, and uh, you cannot stop uh, resources and uh, you know, other parameter in, uh, influence of those things uh, coming to your place as well as going to uh, other uh, countries. So there are the reason we have a much better co coordination and cooperation in these cases, but we have other co cooperation in other areas also. I will come on that. But this is the, as I told, uh, for even the forecasting purpose also, we have the much, much better cooperation in this. Even then, uh, uh, as we know, uh, some of the lacunas are there in the predictions. Prediction is the thing uh, which uh, nobody can say with the certainty of 100% that this will happen. So with this uh, initial remarks, uh, I just wanted to first uh, introduce, uh, uh, most of you are knowing uh, about this thing, but uh, generally uh, Indian space program, what we call it, as all of us know, it is for the development of the nation as well as society. Main thing is uh, societal applications. That is the one of the major goal uh, when we started uh, by uh, pioneer Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, uh, this uh, whole space program itself. Uh, the main uh, reason of his starting was the main for the societal benefits. And then since then, it is going uh, towards that only and uh, not uh, only for the going for the science, only science, because science is there anyhow, when we go on improving anything, science is, is behind science is always there, but it should uh, culminate to the societal benefit. So that's why uh, this whole program, our is still going like that. Under that, there are mainly four uh, dimensions we can say. One is the transportation, as all of us know, uh, different type of launch vehicles, starting from the uh, polar satellite launch vehicle, geostationary, as well as uh, now a reusable launch vehicles are also there. Uh, you may be hearing about the Gaganyan type of things, uh, which will be come back. So that type of uh, vehicles, 
Then comes the space infrastructure where we go for the different type of systems, satellites uh, for the communication because uh, which is most important uh, one of uh, communication satellites and system sensors and then uh, earth observation which will be anyhow uh, discussing my, much more about that. Third thing we started uh, in recent time I can say navigation satellites. Uh, you heard about the INNS satellites from the India Navic. And then uh, space sciences and planetary missions, uh, which is also exploratory missions, uh, uh, Chandrayaan 1, Chandrayaan 2, uh, and Mars mission. And maybe uh, certainly we'll be going for the Aditya solar, and then uh, maybe after some time, maybe Venus and all those planets also. For all those things, uh, one thing is applications, as I told. So, certain uh, applications is uh, important and then uh, all the SDGs, but we are hearing. So, we try to have the uh, go in the line with all the SDGs and uh, importance with the some uh, SDGs. I will come on that food security and the securities. And for everything uh, that uh, it uh, boils down to the how to how do we do it? Uh, because uh, we are having a uh, uh, certain number of persons in uh, everywhere in our center, ISRO, as for each, uh, for every, each type of work. So we, it needs the capacity building. That means we from the all over the India, uh, all other uh, people, so uh, I mean, academia, industries, as well as uh, of all research institutions, they uh, do the joining, join us, and then do the technology advancement and then the applications also uh, for that we have the training programs within india as well as the cooperation by research and announcement of opportunity program for the young generation as well as the institution so that uh, they work with us and anyhow uh, uh, industries are a uh, very big part of us uh, because many of the satellite sensors launch vehicles and everything uh, we depend upon them so, as I told, international, co international cooperation is uh, required because this is a space uh, so always for each and everything. We need the uh, cooperation from the uh, international community. Uh, when we go to the uh, Earth Observation Program out of this, uh, because we will be talking about the ocean, that is comes of the Earth Observation Program. There we have a, a space segment again, where the, we are talking about the satellites, which are working for the source point of view, land and water. Then cartographic satellites and third type of the satellite, what we call it the, we can say it is a science or for the economy or the economy, ocean, weather, and the climate point. These are the space segment. We have a different type of sensors, satellite development. For all those things, we need the ground segment, how the data will be coming because after the sensor has been developed, or the, the, set, the whole sensor and satellites are developed and then uh, goes in space, then data acquisition and processing is uh, one of the major part which we do in the here. And generation of the data, that, that means data products from the, whatever the products we get from the satellites, as well as some of the validation program we do, that means when the satellite is giving any particular data, then how do we say it is correct because it is a not direct observation like when we have the ground observation. So in situ observation also we deal with in certain cases to validate our sensors and dissemination of this information. In applications, uh, there are a lot of uh, different type of applications as I discussed uh, for the uh, one of the major we can say from agriculture is there in the and then uh, forest biomass all those things in uh, environment point of view, ocean, atmosphere, as well as some of the uh, cartographic uh, applications we have. So overall these things that uh, we do mainly uh, to go on updating the information uh, for the country, mainly for the country and for the other places also we do uh, depending on the data information and we generate the information systems and with the uh, tool development with the decision tool so that uh, uh, user or uh, whatever the ultimate person is able to use it uh, effectively. So uh, these are the four, uh, you can say, uh, SDGs point of view. One is the social economic security. Under that, uh, there are many columns are there like food security, when we talk about agriculture, then water security, then uh, hydrology part we do, 
Energy security, here also we come in picture uh, based on the satellite data, I'll come upon that. Then health security with uh, through the uh, communication satellites. Then sustainable development where we do the impact assessment as well as the conservation of the resources. And uh, most important under that is the climate change, which we, uh, we are hearing since uh, last uh, decade or so, more emphasis is being given. So how that uh, climate change is happening, for that you need the mainly the uh, satellite data, long-term satellite data, and overall the uh, global data. So there we have a major role in that. Then any disaster reduction, that is a very, very important, uh, you might have heard about uh, recent also, in Himachal Pradesh, there was a landslide, and then uh, uh, Rishi Ganga, there was the, when the landslide and the floating was there. So uh, we do uh, there, we use our satellite data and our disaster uh, risk reduction team. Uh, we, we work for that. Overall, as um, uh, all of us know, this is the overall ISRO, how it works. There are many centers are there uh, 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 under Department of Space. Uh, these are the uh, major centers, uh, what we call it, uh, where the PSSC launch related and uh, pollution related center. Uh, SDST chart, uh, Admiral Chauhan was talking about where we have the launch. Then uh, URSC is the center. We have the satellite building uh, is there, uh, mainly the whole uh, spacecraft. Space application center, this is an Ahmedabad where uh, actually mostly the sensors are being developed. Uh, for different uh, Earth observations, as well as the communication and the applications uh, and navigation also. Actually, I worked here uh, for almost uh, 35 years in this center uh, prior to coming to next this uh, National Remote Sensing Center where I am today now. Uh, there are this, uh, I'll come upon this center also, National Remote Sensing Center, how this is uh, mainly it is uh, working with the data acquisition, data dissemination, planning, uh, and application. The new center is has come up in the headquarters itself, a human uh, space flight center, uh, mainly for the Gaganian point of view. So these are the one of our major centers, and then we have other centers also, like a initial surface uh, unit, DECU, ice track for tracking, remote sensing, uh, Institute of remote sensing, uh, and then uh, other centers. Uh, all over the India, as we know, uh, we have the. Uh, uh, centers uh, uh, from the ISRO working in uh, for different different domain. Many places we have the tracking centers also uh, for the tracking of different uh, uh, our satellites. National Remote Sense Center actually we have a uh, our center itself is uh, across the all over the India. Where we are, I'm presently in the Balanagar, what we call it National Remote Center headquarters. Then we have another center in the Shadnagar, in 65 kilometers from the Hyderabad itself. Here we have a, what we call IMGOS, that overall integrated uh, uh, earth object system where the data acquisition is there, data processing is there at this center, and some of the earth and climate related uh, study we do. Another outreach center we have uh, in uh, Hyderabad itself. So these three centers are in uh, Hyderabad. This, uh, this is for outreach. Then big up it, this is actually, we have a two aircraft also, uh, National World Sensor had two aircraft uh, for as a, for validation of the purpose of sensor testing, as well as for many other applications we have at this center. In addition, uh, regional remote sensor center we have at different, different places, five places in all over the India, through which uh, we get the work done, they mainly uh, Devote for the regional, uh, that particular regions, like all these five regions, so west, east, central, south, and north. So, uh, together, all of us uh, in the National Remote Center work uh, for the, the country uh, using all the resources what we have in, in our center. In our center, as I told, uh, one is the major thing is satellite data acquisition, uh, which is uh, called, we call it IMGOS, multi mission ground segment. At, uh, as I Told in Chadnagar. Then aerial service is there and uh, data processing, which is uh, one of the major things, as I told, uh, after satellite data is coming, uh, data products are being generated and then uh, the regularly the generation of data products are being done at this place. Then we have training and outreach. Uh, as I told, another center is uh, our system in uh, Hyderabad itself. We do the training outreach program for the students as well as the uh, institutions, research institutions. 
we also have a center in antarctica dr ravindra knows is very well uh, with their uh, cooperation uh, we could have this uh, center in antarctica presently in the bharti as well as in the mathri also uh, these two places from there we get the data there will for the ground station we have then a uh, number of applications uh, we, we have because uh, all the data has to be used uh, Applications. So, I have a number of applications uh, uh, groups we are working, and then earth and climate sciences and dissemination. That is, uh, uh, you know, known about that uh, how they disseminate the data to the Indian data as well as the uh, foreign data it comes to us, and then we disseminate to the uh, all the users uh, to us only. So, overall, uh, this is the uh, how we are working, and then remote sensing. All of us know, so I will uh, because. Uh, I had prepared this slide, but I think uh, no need of uh, explaining this, uh, uh, how we get the data from the source, uh, the different type of sources are there. Uh, one is the, uh, what we call the sensor, one is the passive sensor, one is the active sensor. So all those sensors that uh, uh, Admiral Chauhan was talking about, uh, different different type of uh, sources are there. One is the sun so uh, the source, like for the Sensors like uh, visible sensor, optical sensors, uh, optical uh, ocean color monitor type of sensors, and other passive sensors, and some of the active sensors. I will be talking about that. So all this uh, go through the atmosphere, and then a lot of uh, processing is required. A lot of corrections are required uh, based on that. Since uh, whatever the which sensor is there, which frequency it is working. So these are the overall and then we get the actual data what we use it or what we can see in the image uh, what we get uh, directly to the user three different type of lab, mainly platforms or we are calling one is the ground based as i told uh, these ground based platform that means in situ data also uh, we have uh, many places to so that we collect the data then anyhow uh, satellite based there are many sensors uh, we get the all this data as well as the uh, we started with the, some of the UAV based in one of the center. We have the UAV based uh, data also that is now in thing. Uh, you cannot get anything of a very high resolution and other things by the satellite each and every time, or neither by the aircraft. So uh, UAV is also uh, now integrated into that. So if you want to have the overall global picture with the uh, what is a synoptic picture as well as the high resolution. So you have to combine all those things to really get the information what we want. That is the purpose. Yeah, presently, if you see the capability wise, remote sensing capability, uh, it is the if you go resource wise, we see land and water resources, cartography. There, uh, we had the uh, three tire imaging type of satellite starting from the AWIF sensor with 56 meter going to the very high resolution sensors so for the uh, cartography purpose, submeter, cartoset uh, 3, as well as the cartoset 2. And cartoset 1 was there for the stereo uh, graphy, uh, mainly for the digital elevation model. So these type of sensors are presently working in that. Then in weather and climate, uh, for the geostationary, uh, what we see in the normally pictures, uh, uh, weather pictures uh, through Ministry of Art Science or IMD is inset 3D, 3D art. These two sensors are there, which are the imagers are also there, as well as the 19 channel sounder, which gives the overall atmosphere profile. And by using both the uh, satellites every half an hour, we get the images. So that uh, total almost uh, uh, we get the now if we are having both the uh, working in a tandem, then we get every 15 minutes because every half an hour by each satellite. So we get a very good data set by that uh, forecasting is being done by the India Metrological Department and uh, Ministry of Earth Science. Then we had another sensor called Megatropics, uh, which was a uh, equatorial orbit sensor was there, uh, which is ISRO and CNES. It is very it uh, worked for the some time with the Madras sensor was there for the rain and other things, as well as atmospheric profiles. For oceanography. Uh, as uh, Chauhan was talking about oceans, we initiated with the ocean set one, that with ocean color sensor. Then we uh, went our in the, to the ocean set two, which was having a ocean color monitor as well as the scatterometer, QE band scatterometer, giving the wind vector. And then uh, anyhow, 
Afterwards, we had uh, one uh, sensor for this sketch that we call the scatterometer itself, only scatterometer, but it is, that is required for the uh, what we call it uh, weather forecasting, mainly for weather forecasting purpose, and then ocean forecasting also it is being used. I'll uh, come upon that. So, uh, uh, sorry. And then uh, several Altica, that is altimeter. Uh, we don't have our own altimeter, but uh, with uh, CNS, we had a uh, several Altica altimeter, a uh, beautiful sensor uh, we had. Uh, and it, still it is it's still it is working. So using all those things, we have a number of uh, data sets or the, the profiles uh, as well as the imaging or different different uh, time scale, different different uh, uh, frequency wise uh, using all these sensors for the different applications. And uh, right hand side, you can see these are the, some of the sensors what we have, uh, including the ocean buoy. That means the for the working for the near uh, ocean in the Lakshadweep uh, we are having as well as a number of radars. Uh, uh, when we go to the ocean, then as we know, all of the blue economy is the in thing. And uh, uh, some time back, uh, Ministry of Earth Science, uh, which is the prime agency, we had rolled out that draft uh, blue economy policy itself. For now, because blue economy we are talking since uh, long, but yeah. And this is very, very important. We are seeing the very vast coastline of the India around the 7,500 kilometers, as well as the very, very huge uh, PZ. So uh, we can have the uh, uh, living resources and with a lot of uh, non living resources uh, from this uh, ocean uh, around the India. So Going toward that, uh, uh, Mr. Abar Science wanted to have that uh, how to pool these resources and exploit these resources. So they recognized uh, almost uh, seven themes in which um, one of the major is the coastal marine spatial planning. And then, as all of you know, marine fisheries, aquaculture, that is uh, uh, since long we are doing, and then uh, exploitation of that, and then uh, how to use it uh, properly. Uh, you use uh, Exploit it too much also is not good. So those policies are also required. And then uh, ocean uh, deep sea mining. Now it has uh, also come that mission is also by Mr. Earth Science is being approved. So uh, that is a lot of uh, non-living resources uh, are being uh, being tapped and will be tapped using this type of thing. And then of course the energy, which is the uh, uh, renewable energy from the ocean. It's not presently in that uh, tool, but uh, we can have it because of the technology. Presently, we cannot have, but a uh, lot of things energy can. Be. So we need the uh, satellites for the Earth observation, but for ocean, it is more, much much more important because from the land part, uh, one can go there and have the ground to data. But from the ocean, you, you cannot go at all, uh, each and every places. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, you want to have the synoptic coverage and uh, uh, repetitive coverage of uh, all the ocean. If you really want to know the resources as well as the uh, more important is the forecasting of the ocean. That means uh, knowing what is happening uh, on the many point of like uh, shipping point of view or for the normal uh, point of view and the climate point of view also. So. You need a very, very high frequency in the terms of the time as well as the space. So uh, without satellite, it is almost impossible uh, to go about it. So there was uh, you need a, uh, you cannot have the without the satellite type of sensors. But only thing uh, one of the major disadvantage we can say uh, because the satellite is seeing from the almost 800 kilometer. So it, you see the surface only, and that also not directly uh, measured. Uh, the remote sensing is not exact uh, measurement of any instrument. These are observation only based on uh, what we see technique we developed or well, retrieval techniques based on that. And that also you see the surface. First, based on this uh, surface observations, you one can derive the subsurface information also. That I will also I will come upon uh, how we derive it uh, subsurface information also. Uh, up to uh, quite accurately uh, using the numerical model data assimilation schemes uh, using satellite and other data into that. So that is the uh, one of the major thing because uh, Ministry of 
earth science also has many buoys uh, uh, and the uh, floating platform as well as moored buoys, drifting buoys, but even then they are not sufficient. Main parameters what we get from these things are uh, when we say uh, one is the ocean color uh, through the optical sensor. Which, uh, for, for us, it is a uh, ocean color monitor, OCM2 is presently there. And then uh, uh, maybe after some time, we will have motion set three, the motion color monitor with the improved uh, resolution, improved uh, number of channels, 13 channels, presently it is uh, eight channels. Then another one is the sea surface winds, uh, not only the wind speed, but wind velocity. Then surface waves, uh, this is also one of the very important parameter from the coastal as well as the deeper you know, ocean point of view. Surface temperature, Sea surface height, as all of us know, this is the climate point of view. This is one of the most important parameters when we can say which we which one can get from the only from the satellite. Uh, because in coastal region, you can get from the tides and all those things, uh, but uh, on the open ocean, there is no other way. Then uh, one of the things is uh, sea surface salinity. Uh, what is the salt in the overall, which is most one of the important thing for our human point of view also, consumption point of view also, but from the climate point of view also, salinity is the, one of the major thing. Uh, because the whole the, your process as well as the circulation depends upon this salinity also. So uh, for that, uh, we have a whole electromagnetic spectrum uh, where the, uh, from where uh, we work, but uh, mostly, uh, as of all of us know, uh, sensors are in the visible uh, domain, that is the optical sensor, then uh, infrared domain, visible infrared both, that is the long uh, infrared as well as short wave infrared, then the microwave domain, uh, which we are mostly we call it the radars, active radars. So these three domains mostly uh, we are working. Uh, so these are the some of the optical. I think some question was there. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the chat. Uh, it popped up. Okay. So, we can wait till the yeah. end of your lecture for you yeah. address the question. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah. So these are the frequency, as I told, uh, mainly sensor optical and the radar systems are working. And uh, these are the sensors uh, which have the sun as a source. Uh, so they are optical sensor, mainly based on reflectance as well as the uh, radiation. Uh, Thermal radiation based on the emissivity. Those are the sensors, the uh, optical sensor we have, visible and infrared for spectrum. And then the radar, as I told, uh, passive as well as the uh, active sensor in the micro domain. So these are the radiometers as well as the different uh, sensors like altimeter, scattermeter, compound. Yeah, so why we have the different type of sensor? Because sometimes this question comes why we have different sensor, different frequency, why we choose, uh, why you know, can't we have the whichever frequency I want? Uh, I, I don't, uh, I can't let go. Uh, like uh, some of the sensor, we can 1.432 uh, gigahertz or 1.9 gigahertz, but why we can go? Why we cannot have 5 gigahertz, 6 gigahertz like that? Purpose is that. This type of sensitivity study has been done for the different type of uh, ocean parameters and based on the uh, sensitivity of that parameter with the temperature, what we call it brightness temperature, not the actual temperature, brightness temperature, which is uh, depending upon the sensitivity of, of the uh, your uh, surface as well as the, your uh, sensor itself and emissivity of the target, it depends. So brightness temperature versus the pa parameter. If you see, these are the sensitivity for different, different frequencies. Like salinity has the sensitivity at uh, almost a very very low frequency, almost L band what you call it 1.4 gigahertz generally we have. And then uh, for the wind speed, if you see, it has sensitivity high at uh, almost after the uh, 9 gigahertz or so, and it is flat afterwards. Then for the water vapor, sea surface temperature, we have around uh, 6 gigahertz sensitivity. So that is the reason we divide the sensor uh, based on the sensitivity studies and then other factors also, because if uh, one sensor is uh, at particular frequency is sensitive, but uh, other uh, parameter also will be sensitive at that uh, frequency. 
like if you are going at 6 gigahertz sensor, uh, like the CCF temperature, but the impact of wind is also there in that. So you cannot divide the sensor, uh, make the sensor only for the CCF temperature. Uh, it can, it will not see only the CCF temperature. It will have the sensing because the sensor has the seeing the whole ocean surface. It will have other parameter also will have uh, have impact. So that is the reason sometimes we have the combination of the sensors and then uh, errors in the what we derive the product depend upon all those things also because the, the sensitivity of the sensor is for the number of parameters, not only one parameter of the ocean as well as the most importantly atmosphere. The atmosphere has larger impact uh, on any parameter retrieval we have on the ocean online. So overall, if, uh, when we get the data, this is the uh, data pipeline or the data processing chain. That's what we call it. When the when we get the from ground station raw data, we get then it go to the data processing uh, from the raw data, then voltage and current to the actual uh, level zero, level one, level two, what we call it. Uh, so data processing pre-processing one is there from the uh, voltage and current you uh, convert in the uh, raw data means uh, just for the purpose of starting uh, the processing. Then uh, after doing a lot of uh, signal processing and tools, uh, we correct it for the different uh, radiometry, geometry, as well as the uh, other corrections we do. And after doing all this correction, what we, the image you get is the image. Uh, it can be used by any particular uh, scientist or the user. And from this image also, then next comes the role of uh, all application scientists where they derive the information because image is the image where you get the so each pixel you get the some value. But from that, how you derive the information itself, that is the most important part. There are application uh, scientist part. And in between, when we are doing processing, you have to evaluate data, what type of data is there, because the data, as I told, there will be corrections are required. Then we data evolution, quality evolution is one of the major uh, part, which goes in the processing chain, uh, regular processing chain. So overall, uh, this is the way uh, we do. Uh, we also as a digital virtual DEM is being used in the when we get the data, then we get the ortho image based on the satellite based positioning that is navigation and the mobile data collection. We get the uh, image as well as the generation of the information. And when this information goes for the various uh, societal application, various ministries for the mapping, and suit applications uh, for the uh, different different, different uh, ministries and then also for the modeling purpose that's the numerical modeling and then we do for the getting the predictions so based on all those things uh, we generate the information uh, basically uh, if you see the how we derive the information main one thing is as i told reflection based in the optical region by which we derive the number of parameters from the, for example, from ocean color monitor, uh, chlorophyll, sediment, turbidity, vegetation index, as well as many other parameters uh, in the ocean itself. Based on the thermal infrared, we have the sensors, uh, like inset sensor is there, as well as earlier we have another sensor. Uh, from that, we get the very, very important parameter, sea surface temperature. From and then the, also the land surface temperature and the atmosphere parameters uh, like rain, cloud, water vapor, etc. Uh, sensor for the where we get the back scattering, uh, that is the optical sense, uh, sorry, uh, micro sensors or active sensors. Through that, we get the parameters like ocean surface winds, ocean surface waves, oil spill, salinity, how much uh, spread water in the inundation, what we call it. In the case of disaster, then in the passive microwave sensors, uh, which are based on the principle of emission, we get the salinity, sea surface temperature, winds, etc. And then uh, this sensor uh, altimeter, what we call it, uh, based on the uh, active uh, principle, sea level was well, one of the most important parameter from there. Then ocean surface waves, sea bounds, uh, also uh, we try to get, and then gravity. Uh, sensor, that's the grace. We don't have any, any sensor here uh, for that. We get the geoid as well as the groundwater. So, optical sensor, as we are discussing that uh, using that uh, presently, we are having a 
8 bit uh, ocean color monitor. To that, we get a uh, different different uh, parameter in the ocean, and uh, I'll show some of the beautiful pictures what we get from this sensor. Even by pictures itself, uh, one can see uh, how that information can be derived. Uh, anyhow, there's a uh, much much more uh, uh, what we say uh, processing is required, or what the science is required uh, because the what we get in the sensor information is very very actually less uh, than the whatever the contamination we have from the atmosphere because these are the passive sensors and sensitivity has to be very very uh, high in that case even then uh, because of the atmosphere we have uh, uh, many uh, problems in that this is the just uh, one picture from the uh, ocean color monitor and we can see the different type of waters itself uh, in the right hand side you see from the satellite pictures uh, different type of because of the turbidity in the uh, ocean as well as the because of the sediment you get the uh, different type of color directly even if you go near the coast also we can see but uh, from the satellites uh, we can see the different quality of the waters from the section these are the different type of uh, waters we see this uh, top is the actual image of photography then uh, center is a uh, at different channels, how we see uh, the different uh, type of waters and you can uh, delineate. But uh, if you really want to delineate different type of uh, water quality, then you need uh, hyperspectral sensor. That is very, very fine uh, uh, spectral resolution sensor. Whatever presently uh, we are having is the uh, ocean color monitor is not a hyperspectral, but uh, we are planning to have hyperspectral sensor also so that we can have really uh, each and every aspect of the water can be studied. And this is an example from the one airborne sensor, every NG, uh, what uh, we have flown over India. Uh, this is an example of that. And then uh, how the spectrum changes for the different type of water, so, uh, what we see from the even algae also, you can see, see uh, and uh, sea dome, all those parameters you can see. Uh, these are the normal parameters what we get uh, from the ocean color monitor regularly. Uh, uh, left hand side, the chlorophyll, uh, TSM, AOD, that uh, aerosol optical depth. That's what I was talking about. Aerosol optical depth is the one of the major uh, parameter as a major uh, source of error in deriving all these ocean parameters. But we, uh, we derive this uh, based on the uh, bands what we have. In addition to that, but we have uh, other some value addition parameter also that means uh, total absorption how we can have sea dome absorption also so these products are regularly being generated these are beautiful some of the images i wanted to see we have beautiful images from the ocean color monitor itself uh, we have an uh, atlas actually uh, based on the ocean color monitor uh, is available so it shows the uh, beautiful like the coral reefs you see as well as uh, near the uh, from Putta region, you see the different type of waters are discharged, but because there's a lot of discharges there uh, from the Brahmaputra and Ganges. So you see which is going to the ocean, and this has a lot of impact on the uh, Bay of Bengal region, what we study in the oceanography. And uh, this is also different type of uh, things like in disaster oil slicks, as well as the uh, different uh, algal blooms uh, you can see in the uh, ocean color in images. Uh, so these are the, some of the images I took from the uh, atlas itself to show that uh, not only the water parameters are regularly being derived, but different other uh, information can be derived using this type of sensors are being derived. And uh, application we know very well. This is one of the major application of this sensor is the potential fishing zone, which uh, is being done by uh, uh, inquiries. Uh, based on inquiry uh, uh, in Hyderabad itself and other any other parameters are also there but one of the major thing what we call it PFZ is uh, one of the ma major parameter then uh, another uh, parameter is a sea surface temperature uh, uh, what is mainly it is a uh, right from the thermal sensors there are some micro sensors also but micro sensor only one of the issue what we call it the uh, uh, resolution is quite poor in uh, for 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer, but in thermal infrared sensor accuracy uh, is also high, which work in the uh, TIR region. And uh, their resolution is also much better. So uh, we will having in you know, Ocean Set 3, uh, uh, this sensor one 
SSTM, what we call CSV temperature monitor also. And uh, this is a number of applications of the CSV uh, temperature are there when they see the uh, eddies, uh, sub scale eddies on the fronts, the fronts so by using the front itself, uh, uh, you can get the uh, earlier we used to as a particular fishery zone PFZ based on the front itself. It is started from the only the one parameter from the PFZ, uh, this is from the front. But later on, we uh, started ha having the other parameters also, like sea level also we uh, included and the winds also we are including so that it will improve the PFZ. But uh, one of the major thing is the sea temperature and not only this uh, parameter uh, application, but like uh, other processes, uh, climate change process, climate uh, related process are there like uh, El Nino and La Nina when we talk about that uh, based on uh, only this and then the prediction of this is basically on this uh, temperature. And then it, so these are the monitoring, uh, regularly monitoring of this season temperature uh, based on this sea uh, surface temperature and there are a number of sensor, our sensor as I told in that 3D, 3D R are there, but there are many, many other sensors like uh, Another very good sensor, AVHR, the very high resolution uh, radiometer is there where, by which you can get. Then uh, uh, passive, uh, there is a number of radiometers are there. That means they get the emitted radiation from the earth surface, land as well as ocean. From the but uh, from the point of view of the oceanography, uh, I will uh, just talking about the three sensor. One is the S map is a soil moisture active acid sensor, which is the uh, for the sea surface salinity. Then another one is the Aquarius, which is having a micro imaging radiometer with aperture synthesis, and uh, that is a SMOS. And then uh, Aquarius. These three sensors are uh, providing the sea surface salinity with the high accuracy. Uh, difference between these two are there. One is uh, having the radiometer only. Other one is having the uh, radars because of radars also you can get the uh, higher accuracy. So these are the sensor and as I told, salinity is one of the very very important parameter. Not only from the point of the uh, uh, using the, the coastal region, but in the open ocean uh, because the whole water cycle depends upon that uh, salinity. Uh, uh, and then it is, uh, has the circulation of the whole ocean circulation uh, has the dependency upon that uh, that what we call the uh, ocean cycle. But uh, salinity is a uh, uh, changes are very very less if we say really uh, we say normally uh, 35 ppt uh, is the normal uh, salinity. So that uh, changes are not much, and when we want to derive it from the uh, satellite. Uh, it has to be very, very uh, sensitive sensor has to be there. That's why I was talking radio uh, radars is also there as well as the in combination with the radiometer it is being derived. But even then, a uh, lot of uh, uh, inaccuracies because of the atmosphere, as I told, as an ionosphere, the sensor is working in the very, very low frequency, 1.4 gigahertz. So impact of ionosphere is also large. So we have to take into account the effect of ionosphere and then atmosphere. Then uh, from the when we come to the surface, that means the ocean surface roughness, that means how the because of the wind, uh, how the roughness is changing, that have very large impact on the salinity itself. So that is also uh, we have to take into account. And one of the major uh, challenges was there in the radio frequency interface, RFI, what we call it, in the coastal regions where they had the other type of systems also there. So uh, using that, uh, but even then. Uh, with these challenges, uh, salinity is being derived with a uh, good accuracy. And these are the three sensors, but see the how the salinity are changing. This is just one uh, example from the all three sensors from the Aquarius S map as well as the uh, SMOS of different time period. Uh, we also based on this uh, data, global data, as I told, this uh, data is globally available. So we also try to derive that uh, sea surface salinity with different uh, methodology so that accuracy can be uh, improved. And then uh, this methodology we showed that uh, accuracy is uh, better by our estimation than the actually being derived uh, operationally. So this uh, retrieval uh, accuracy, uh, we do this type of work also, not only with other sen our sensor, but other sensor also. 
so that when our, our sensor is being developed, that time we are equipped with the, this type of methodology. Then when we come to the radars, uh, there are three types of radar. One is altimeter, then is spectrometer, and third one is uh, synthetic composite radar. As you know, uh, uh, radars uh, are having uh, uh, their own uh, system of uh, source. So that's why we call it backscattered uh, radiation. And backscattered radiation depends upon the how much radiation you are giving uh, from the, your source. And then uh, what is the angle at which it is working? So based on that, it has a, a different impact uh, on the backscatter signal. And more, more and more roughness is there, you will get the more and more signal if you are seeing from a different angle. But for altimeter, it is totally uh, inverse. Altimeter, uh, 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 I was thinking uh, I'll dwell upon it more, but uh, as uh, everybody is knowing about the altimeter much, so I will not go much in detail. But uh, when we are talking about the uh, altimeter, uh, it is very easy to say that uh, we are able to see the accuracy of the few centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter. But if you really see what we what we are observing from the space from 800 kilometer, we, are, we have to get the only the range. We are getting the range from the time uh, taken from the sensor is uh, giving the signal, sending the signal, and get, getting it back. But in between, there are a lot of lot of uh, uh, phenomena that are taking place. Like first thing is accuracy of the range itself. You should have very very accurate range. Certain places you can have. Uh, but because of the orbit, you have the uh, different errors. Uh, so you have the stations like a uh, laser range station or Dory station by that uh, first thing is orbit has to be corrected. Then if you have the orbit correction also, then we have the atmosphere uh, problem like a uh, troposphere, anospheric, uh, anospheric is not that in, the, in this uh, frequency range because we are talking about the 13 gigahertz, 14 gigahertz, but uh, uh, because of water vapor cloud, there are the, uh, uh, inaccuracy in the range. Uh, then uh, we have the uh, when we signal comes to the ocean itself. Then uh, because the geoid, uh, you have the inaccuracies. So using all those things, uh, phenomena, uh, we are trying to have the correction in sea surface height. What we call it because of orbit, because of range, and number of errors like atmosphere. And one uh, major error is sea state bias. What we call it because of the ocean. Waves, ocean waves are supposed to be when we call it sinusoidal, but they are not sinusoidal uh, in fact. So, because that are also errors uh, are there. So, all these errors uh, combine, and then you see uh, from the eight, uh, 800 kilometer versus 2 centimeter accuracy, what we are talking about is a, a really a challenge uh, getting such accuracy from the and uh, developing such sensor uh, is also uh, is really challenging, not only the sensor, altimeter sensor. But all the sensors uh, to correct uh, these phenomena. So that is a major challenge ultimately. And how it gets the uh, signal? It is sending the signal. Then the waveform is uh, formed. I just just depicting uh, the picture. How it is getting the signal is uh, touching the surface. Then uh, waves uh, start developing. That is, uh, and then afterwards, then the full uh, wave is. Uh, signal has gone to the ocean that is the pulley for one of the wave then uh, we get the uh, backscattered uh, waveform what we call it and based on this waveform we derive the basically three parameters one is the range uh, from which we derive the sea level and then another parameter is significant wave height uh, that is all based on this only uh, wave uh, shape of the wave, the return pulse, and then the wind speed. Based on the roughness, we get the wind speed also, not the direction, but the speed of the uh, wave. So this is the major uh, principle of deriving the pulse parameter. So this is the just example uh, left hand side. How this power is changing based on different 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 uh, wave height. So uh, you can see where, uh, this is the center from which the center we derive the actually the midpoint we call it the from where we get the sea level and the shape of this return pulse we get the wave uh, height. So this phenomena are uh, in deriving. Them. This is the picture uh, of how the if a satellite is able to do uh, uh, sea level changes uh, monitoring. And uh, since uh, earlier and comparison with the all this uh, tight gauge data, uh, uh, the satellite started in 
almost uh, 80 uh, from the geo set uh, but uh, you can see the trend is uh, uh, almost the same by with a seaborne satellite uh, because tide gauge data is only a few places but satellite is at each and every places so trend is uh, matching and if you see the really the sea level from the only from the satellite point of view itself then you see the monitoring of the uh, regularly by the different uh, satellites uh, one of the challenge in these the satellites also suppose one one satellite is uh, accuracy of each satellite also has to be almost similar and then not the accuracy bias bias between each satellite has to be uh, reduced and uh, make the same then only you can say uh, if you are having two satellites or three satellites and combine those data uh, you, uh, because uh, what we are talking about the is it, uh, accuracy of the millimeters uh, that uh, changes in the per year or so, uh, so three millimeter per three millimeter per year what we see from the present uh, uh, satellite data and uh, but uh, uh, as I told earlier uh, our accuracy is not the millimeter accuracy is the centimeter of the absolute accuracy in centimeter but uh, relative accuracy uh, you, you can get in the uh, millimeters so that is the uh, way uh, overall uh, uh, sea level changes one of the most important parameter in the uh, altimetry is be, uh, being done and uh, using a number of altimeters and uh, uh, my uh, sentinel 6 also uh, will be having a continuation of this uh, altimetry this is several antica this is a different type of altimeter itself because all other altimeter what's in ku band but this was the car band uh first time altimeter uh earlier there was a lot of uh doubts also there whether how good it will be there uh, for the coastal region as well but this uh, sensor proved to be very very good for the coastal regions also as well as from the accuracy point of view uh because it is a high frequency so atmospheric impact is there but even then uh, it has been seen in the long term it is a uh, absolutely beautiful sensor uh, from the ultimately point of view and we uh, in addition to the global products are being derived by the global agency and by us also but in addition we try to derive the coastal product for the indian ocean region itself whatever data we had so coastal product up to 50 kilometer uh, we try to uh, derive in addition to the other sea uh, uh, ice thickness uh, type of parameter for the polar regions uh, next sensor is coming. Uh, this is a SWAT vertical surface water ocean topography mission. Uh, because the altimeter is a sensor which is very, very actually narrow swath. It is almost uh, 2 kilometer to 8 kilometer swath is there. That means uh, you can map only the 2 kilometer, 8 kilometer. That's why you need many, many altimeters in orbit if you really want to uh, see the uh, over, uh, whole ocean. That is a major drawback of the altimeter because the other sensor, what we talk about the uh, sort of the you know, thousand kilometer, five hundred kilometer, like that. But this sensor is uh, like a line. So because of that, uh, there is a uh, sensor is being uh, is coming up. This is the wide swath altimeter for the mainly for the, the surface topography and also for the hydrology point of view uh, for the land hydrology. This is uh, based on the interferometry. This sensor uh, will be there, and uh, uh, we assume that this sensor will be uh, one of the uh, good sensor and uh, game changer in the altimetry. Then we, yeah, uh, then we come the uh, second sensor. This is uh, in the radars, is spectrometer. Uh, uh, it is the mainly for the ocean surface wind vector. Uh, so earlier we were talking about wind speed, but it uh, give the wind speed as well as direction because it is seeing from a different angle uh, uh, as well as the different antennas. Two antenna, three antenna, uh, like that. I just show some example. These are the two antennas. One is a you know, horizontal beam that is a 46 degree, and the 50 degree is the second antenna. And go on uh, moving like pencil beam uh, scattermeter is there, is our own scattermeter. And the swath, you see, this is a 1800 kilometer swath, uh, the large swath, but resolution is a, we call it 25 kilometer, 50 kilometer, but like this. And it uh, as it moves uh, along the path, it gives the uh, observations. And by these observations, we derive in that path wind vector cell. Will you call it so that uh, we get that uh, 
all this way, each 25 kilometer, and then now we are driving at this six every six kilometer also this values. Uh, how would you give them any speed uh, and uh, direction just to show the example? Uh, because if uh, angle dependency is there uh, on the roughness, as I told you, because the backscattering is there. The big based on the backscattering wind speed, uh, backscatter uh, based on the incidence angle and wind speed, your backscatter changes. So, based on this phenomena, uh, we have uh, derived the different angles at which angle you should have the more sensitivity, like 50 degree uh, or so. So, our uh, scatterometer is a 50 degree, and then two angles by having the two angles as well as two polarization, we derive the direction also. Like this, this is the direction. Uh, sensitivity of the direction to the angle what we are looking so based on this uh, logic uh, we have the pencil beam uh, rotating antenna and then we get the wind speed as well as the direction all this information is being used to get that uh, we had a uh, two scatterometers so one is our ocean set two uh, with the ocm uh, there and then after what we set set one almost uh, similar uh, both are almost uh, similar scatterometer one is launched in 2009, other 2016. But the only advantage of the set one was there uh, because of the uh, earlier some problem in the ocean set two. It has a cross patch uh, chain as well as the uh, wind vector cell size. Uh, now earlier was 50 kilometer, then 25 kilometer, and now we are going for 6.25 kilometer. And the accuracy of wind is also very high in this case. Uh, what we call it the uh, maybe around, around one meter per second accuracy. What we are to provide and this is the which uh, when we are working in the uh, all the global agency sketch set has been found to be approached approximately climate quality uh, winds climate quality winds uh, your wind speed bias as i told accuracy is one thing but bias should be on the around 0.1 meter per second per decade it should be there when you have a, a series of scattering so now uh, almost we are reaching uh, by reprocessing the data again and again uh, there are the different different applications of this, uh, like we derived the for oceanography point of view, uh, average wind vector over the globe uh, every six hourly and every twelve hourly, and then is being used the. But um, major applications is for the numerical weather prediction models, as well as for the cyclone cases. I will show some examples. Cyclone cases. This is the instrument which is being used uh, for the not only for cyclone prediction, for cyclogenesis. Uh, that is cyclone is being developed that time itself one can derive the uh, mid time formation these are number of products uh, as i told uh, one is the swath base that means uh, around 18 every 18 kilometer we get the wind then uh, right hand side the global winds every 12 hours or so and then uh, some of the products for the polar regions as well as the land region also these are some uh, ingenuity why ingenuity our uh, Scientists at the Space Application Center derived the hydrological problem that is river water level also using that. Uh, so this I was talking about the tropical cyclone monitoring. This is the instrument is being used uh, very regularly. Uh, and then uh, uh, is able to predict the cyclone um, three days and four days in advance itself uh, after uh, before the development of cyclone or before it is called as a cyclone uh, by cyclogenesis by seeing the pattern of the uh, Winds. Uh, this is one of the major. Then third uh, is instrument which is called the synthetic radar uh, instrument, similar to scatterometer, what we call it, but it is a uh, because of the aperture is synthesized, so it gives a very very high resolution. Instead of uh, in scatterometer, we call that resolution kilometers, 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer, but in this case, because of the aperture synthesis, uh, resolution is the meters, two meter, four meter, like that. Uh, we had uh, you might have heard about this uh, RI set one. Uh, was there and mainly for the uh, land uh, purpose and uh, for other resources, but ocean also you have a number of parameters like ocean wave spectrum, internal waves, coastal bathymetry, ship detection, and many, many other parameters we could do. Yeah, this is one of the sensor it will be jointly by NASA and ISRO uh, will be coming. Uh, was probably in 2023, uh, early 2023. This is the two frequencies, uh, L band and S band. S band is being uh, by India and L band is being uh, developed by NASA. This is scatterometer at basic advantage of this spectrum. Uh, sorry, sensitive project radar is it is giving higher resolution. That means the scale of the meters 
as well as the uh, larger swaths. So this is the uh, because all other uh, centrifuges they have either the resolution higher than swath is less, or if a resolution is poor then swath is uh, uh, large. But in this case you are having advantage of both uh, high resolution as well as the uh, larger swath, and this will be used mainly for the uh, ecosystem. System land deformation was a major thing by interferometry and the using of the polarimetry. You have uh, many many geological application and the uh, ecosystem disturbance that way, as well the crisis. Yeah. So we are uh, still in the process of uh, uh, discussing with the science teams, uh, both the science team, uh, to have the derive some uh, basic science of that, like in the polar regions, uh, how the glaciers are changing, how the ice sheets are changing. As well as the forest biomass uh, changes and disturbances, in addition to many many other parameters. These are some examples of the RA set over the ocean, as I was talking about. That the coastal regions, you can get the wind power that we try to derive, and uh, ocean surface wave height, as well as the uh, cyclone cases, winds, high resolution winds. These are the some uh, internal waves what we can de derive from the Radar, as well as the coastal bathymetry, as we're talking about, uh, the high resolution uh, bathymetry. This inference, not directly, as a, uh, because it sees the surface, but even then, all those things. And then, uh, one of the major things is oil spill uh, detection, uh, very easy detection, and the ship detection, it can be done. For coastal bathymetry, there are different different methods. So, so just with, uh, uh, we are trying to have a hybrid method using the different. Uh, Optical as well as SAR data, and some uh, this is example how we trying to have the using the in situ versus bathymetry by the satellite how accurately uh, we could uh, try to do it. This is still in the R and D stage. Uh, from optical also that I told optical as well as this uh, how we trying to derive it. in the energy as we're talking about uh, this is one of the Major thing uh, presently in the oceanography point of view, you see that different type of energies are there: tidal energy, wave energy, thermal energy, as well as the salinity based energy. But presently, we can say uh, we are mostly can say wind energy point of view. It is uh, uh, easily it can be technology wise. It is there. Wave energy is being tried at certain places, but it's still uh, it is costly based on the technology. But satellite has a lot of role in that. Uh, based on the satellite data repeated coverage as well as the modeling and in situ data, we can uh, really define the regions which are the potential for the uh, energy, coastal as well as the both offshore. Where we use a different type of sensor like synthetic posture radar, as I told, for wind and wave, spectrometer for the wind energy in the offshore region to the coastal region, and altimeter for the wind wave. All those things can be used. One of the major uh, applications of uh, when we go from the, all these parameters from the ocean state forecast, as I was talking about, where you have the role of the uh, your sensors, uh, space bear, as well as the modeling. So what we do in the ocean uh, forecast, our main aim is to do the assimilation of this flight data into the numerical model. In the wave model, to get the wave forecast. In the circulation model, to get the circulation and SST type of forecast. And the biogeochemistry also in the coupled model. So, uh, in the space application center, Ahmedabad, uh, we are working uh, towards that and we are providing this information after assimilation, uh, this uh, techniques and course, uh, and it is uh, testing after it is being developed. Then we transfer to the inquiries, Ministry of Earth Science, and presently for the wave model as well as circulation model, we have uh, uh, given their uh, techniques and it is being. Used operationally for that. So, in that case, uh, we are going from the global model, that means the uh, coastal resolution, to the very, very high resolution, that means up to the 100 meter resolution for the coast, uh, particular uh, uh, area wise uh, modeling as well as the forecast also. So, here this is a major role comes of the uh, your uh, sensors, the uh, two sensors one is the uh, altimeter for the uh, wave as well as the uh, sea level as the, and the temperature sensor. So, based on this. Uh, for a lot of forecast uh, is being done. And this uh, subsurface information, as I told, this also are being derived using the surface parameter like sea surface temperature, sea surface salinity, and the sea surface height. So all these parameters uh, are being used and then uh, modeling 
and data assimilation techniques are being used to derive the uh, subsurface information and constructing the uh, profile of the ocean. So this uh, type of information is uh, being derived, and uh, one of the site I will talk about that uh, this is a MOSDEC site we call it from the ISRO. Uh, there is this uh, information is also there, and these are some examples of the uh, data assimilation what we are doing uh, from the ocean for different different uh, purpose. Uh, like I talk about the biogeochemistry also as well as the wave and circulation in biological photography also. Uh, improved uh, potential fishery zone that uh, we have transferred to the inquiries uh, that you know, after making some uh, technology improvement as well as the, uh, based on the flow, uh, how it can be uh, improved here. And then coupled by this uh, physical simulations for the PFZ also are being done. Coastal and geological uh, oceanography also. We are working towards the how the coastal and coasts are changing based on that uh, shoreline change atlases uh, uh, based on the optical data uh, we are doing. And then one of the uh, recently three four years back we started the rip current forecasting for the some of the regions coastal regions uh, beaches uh, based on the data as well as the modeling uh, because the tourist places uh, rip currents like Vishakha Patnam and Goa these are very actually dangerous thing. So uh, that also we have started based on the modeling uh, as well as the sensor, uh, satellite sensor, as well as the Navic sensor we used for this part. This was the cyclone case uh, parameter I was talking about. The, starting from the cyclone, that is cyclogenesis, when the cyclone is e being developed, the satellite data is being used, then for prediction of track we are using, then ship avoidance region we are giving for the shipping corporation, and then continuous monitoring of that uh, till the cyclone in the ocean. Then after the storm surge for forecasting, and then last for the international forecasting, all the process are being done uh, between different institutions, uh, space application center as well as the national remote sensing center, to get the complete information for the disaster point of view. The last, these are the some of the sites uh, uh, so you, you people can go afterwards because I will not be dealing about these things. One is the Bowen site from the NRC. There is a lot of information of all these data also, uh, whatever free data is available from the ISRO in data as well information of this can be get uh, from the Bowen site. Then uh, next is the MOSDEC site, Meteorological Oceanographic Satellite Data Archival. There you get the mostly weather. Uh, and the ocean related information as well as data and uh, numerical modeling related uh, forecast we give. Then third is the Vedas site. This is uh, for the space application center site, which gives the land uh, related information. And this is a uh, ISRO site. Uh, overall, we are getting the, all this uh, information about ISRO and all this. So these are the uh, different uh, sites I was talking about. And this is a uh, you go to the meteorological site, you get the, all this information about the uh, atmosphere sensors and then the forecast, now past, and all those things uh, can get. And we, uh, as well as the visualizations of the different schemes, the mobile based as well as the, the tech based. In Bhuvan, you get that 2D, 3D uh, information as well as uh, on the mobile also, data download is available, thematic, number of thematic uh, layers are available, which uh, one can use for their uh, own purpose in their uh, for the knowledge as well for information. Thank you. Uh, so all this material uh, is not mine. <laughs> so I've used from the different different places for my colleagues. Uh, so I thank all of them uh, for this uh, contribution for this. Thank you very much. Thank you so, uh, so much, Dr. Kumar, for that comprehensive and enthralling presentation, and also for simplifying the theme, which has afforded us tremendous insights and perspective. We will now turn towards the question and answer segment over the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. And it gives me a great honor to once again invite Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, the Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, to moderate the audience interaction. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Satyam. But uh, more importantly, let me first uh, reiterate uh, the thanks that you have already extended to uh, Dr. Rajkumar for an absolutely enthralling, enriching, comprehensive presentation. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar, I'm afraid I do not have as many adjectives as are required to be able to do justice 
to you and to your pres uh, presentation and the explanations that you have given. Uh, I'm aware that this is a very large subject and you have covered it with commendable uh, conciseness. Uh, so thank you. Now we uh, obviously have a number of questions and I myself had the first two, uh, which uh, came in somewhat earlier. As soon as I saw the Saral slide, I'm sorry that there's a typographical error in, uh, in that one A is missing from the Saral KA band or Demeter. What I really wanted to ask you was, could you expand, you already expanded upon the K band altimeter and the multiple uh, satellite uh, based altimeters measurements and also told us very valuable inputs uh, information with regard to satellite bias. But uh, if we were to compare these two, you already also explained the difficulties in uh, finding centimetric or millimetric uh, uh, changes in sea level on account of all the reasons that you have uh, expounded so well. But as uh, as you know, the, the GRACE follow on, uh, we all know that the GRACE uh, program per se is over, but GRACE follow on satellites don't actually bounce anything off the earth. They are measuring the distance and the speed of one satellite from the other. And uh, being able to measure that in very fine degree of accuracy, uh, they are then able to correlate that to gravitational pull in one or the other direction as they as they proceed. It means uh, this is just for the benefit of those who don't know about grace. Uh, this is not for you. Uh, and so the where there is a stronger gravitational pull, the distance between these two satellites increases and you can then correlate. So my question is. First is that. How can we uh, should how should we compare and did ISRO uh, already consider this and reject it or. What is the state? And the second question is more specific, which is that if we've got research scholars, as I've told you, we have and many research scholars exist. Uh, who are doing um, local measurements of um, slight uh, change in general and sea level rise in particular, and they have been trying to utilize and integrate data that they get from the gauges of the tidal stations that exist uh, and the data available from satellite based experiments, whether altimeter based or uh, gravity based. So there is a there is obviously two forms of data. One is physical, one is um, space based, and there is a problem in integration. And surprisingly, the greater information in terms of accessibility of information is actually available through ISROs and the other websites that you have been kind enough to highlight. Whereas to get information from the tidal gauges uh, and the tidal data, uh, data stations seems to be much more difficult. So if you assume that we have a field uh, set up where field researchers are feeding data, which we can in the NMF use to make uh, policy recommendations, uh, we need to be sure that the data which is obtained from the field is accurate. Uh, because all our, all our um, recommendations will be appropriately um, changed otherwise. So if, how might this be done? Is there any way that if it's too long a question, it's too long an answer to deliver right now? Is there some point of contact that my our researchers can approach uh, from you or from your colleagues? And uh, could you just expand upon this as the first question? Uh, I'm sorry to, uh, to hog the first two questions, but I thought that uh, I would seek everybody's indulgence for the same. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, regarding this, this uh, data, uh, uh, yeah, this is actually a very good uh, research topic, we can say, because uh, of, uh, as I told, uh, that is the purpose we want uh, other people to be involved in this uh, type of studies. Uh, uh, tide gauge data is very, very important and difficult to get. Yeah. Uh, for that, if we can uh, assimilate what we call the, uh, our terms is normally, I uh, use it as assimilation. Uh, assimilation of data from the satellite as well as GST. These two first thing has to be checked, uh, what we call it uh, uh, validation of the data. Uh, either uh, both the ways, uh, when we are trying to calibrate anything uh, like any instrument, then we do from the actual uh, sensor based or internal calibration based. And then we uh, comparing with the data as you are telling, uh, because the data may be coming tight data from a number of sources. So those sources also has to be authenticated means uh, 
how good is the data? Because somebody is giving the tight gate data, uh, we have to see the how much errors in that. So if uh, first uh, uh, we have to see that uh, if it is a good data or uh, uh, correct data, that will be highly useful for uh, uh, talking about that uh, for the coastal altimetry point of view. Uh, but because we want to de derive such products and we have derived also, I think uh, uh, I, I'll give the name also, the person in the space of the center are working uh, with that. Uh, so they can de derive much, much better products uh, from the, anyhow, Saral is one of the thing where the, you can go very near the coast. Other altimeters problem is the, uh, you are unable to go near the coast. The, there are two reasons. One is the footprint is uh, larger. Another thing is what we uh, see the errors in the troposphere, uh, what we get the troposphere uh, modeling from the different numerical models. So that is around, uh, we go to five kilometers, 10 kilometers. And the, these changes are near the, in the Indian region. So uh, what we were trying earlier uh, to have the higher resolution of modeling so that troposphere errors are less or ionospheric errors are less. Based on these errors less, then we can derive much, much better uh, is uh, sea level near the coastal regions. So this will be a good topic for the research. I think uh, uh, we, will, we can certainly join the hands uh, with that. I think you are mute. Thank you very much. Yeah. One quick add on, uh, if I may. You know, in the tidal uh, stations uh, and in the satellite, uh, I don't know whether we are using, first of all, the same geoid. So, uh, is is the uh, what is the geoid being used in different tidal stations? Are they using the same geoid? Are they using different geoids? Uh, also, would need to be determined because then you know if you're using Everest or you're using WS5, what, what are you using? And uh, what are you using? And then are you using the same as say, for example, NASA is using? Uh, is NASA using the same geoid as the e, uh, European Space Agency is using? Are they using the same as the German National Space Agency? What I'm trying to say is that there seems to be a, a, a requirement to standardize uh, what is the base level uh, data, what is the base references, not only in the troposphere, but also in the measurement of the Earth itself. So I think that... Uh, we would be very happy to engage with you on uh, some of these subjects, and I think that it would be useful to us. But let me not hog any more of the time that is available, which is limited. And uh, let me move on to uh, the next question. Uh, and that is uh, a question which is uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Yoga Jyotsna Varanasi, whose uh, question is uh, whether uh, uh, Yoga, what happened to the first part of your question? Uh, would you like to just take the mic? Maybe Oliver, you can unmute her and uh, Yoga can ask the question I think I, herself. I, I, I see, I think. The question is, I think, uh, how are using drone technology for coastal security management? Is that, yeah, I think. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah. Whether, yeah. whether it is under state or central. Yeah, that the first part it. of the question was truncated. Yeah, I, I posted it. Uh, we are not doing Thank that you, actually. Yeah, because coastal security it is not an hour that uh, drone, drone we are not using for that purpose. Uh, uh, whatever drone uh, uh, we are having in the northeast, mainly for the land and all those purposes. For coastal no, security, but, uh, it, yeah. Let me, let me buttress that point because Yoga's point is actually a good one. Uh, Jyotsan's points are always good. So. There is, uh, you know, an intermediate between drone or aircraft based uh, observations and satellite based observations. There is an intermediate level and that is normally handled not by the drone technologies of high altitude, uh, long endurance drones or tail or male or any of those, but utilizing lighter than aircraft, which are able to then carry the same sensors as might be fitted on board a satellite with a much larger payload carrying capacity for obvious reasons and uh, and a long endurance measured in months. So uh, even if we are not doing this, even if we're not currently engaged in this area, I think that it is nevertheless a very good area to explore uh, and to examine as to whether we can't supplement the satellite data because of the high expense in one case, and also because there is a marked reluctance amongst the aviation community anywhere in the world to actually look at lighter than aircraft uh, because they are not as um, seductive 
as heavier than aircraft, uh, whether manned or unmanned. So I'm just proposing that this is a, not an area that we should uh, dismiss. Uh, even for ocean measurements, we should try and look at the whole gamut of uh, of uh, platforms from satellite downwards. Now I understand that ISRO will look at one, but while we look at others, we will need ISRO's guidance and uh, helping hand and you know all that. So I, I really think that it's a, it's it's another area which is well worth studying. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is a, that's what I threw uh, in the beginning. Drone technology is be is should be used because uh, one thing is satellite is in synoptic view. Another thing comes on the aircraft. What we are using that also you cannot use whenever you want. You have to plan. You have to take permissions for the aircraft that you can use for the some period. And then for the immediately if you want to have then you have your drone. So all three technology we have to combine and then use. Uh, so that is a yeah we have to do it. But I told presently we are not because. Uh, in our center, what we are presently dealing with the aircraft as a only a spacecraft for the like a ALTM and a monitoring of the these regions. But drone, yeah, we are thinking about uh, applying the drones also, and uh, then uh, we can have the all three technology together to have the complete information. Yeah. So that's anyway. where uh, that's where organizations like the NMF might be able to be of great value to uh, all of us. So thank you, uh, Jyotsna, and thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Let me move to Dr. Pushp Bajaj, who uh, has asked whether he could uh, ask his first question uh, or his questions on audio. So maybe we'll we'll uh, allow him to do that. So um, Jyotsna, if you could mute your mic, uh, you've already done that. Sorry. And so Pushp, it's over to you. I'll mute mine. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajkumar, for the uh, very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Uh, for my first question, I wanted to talk about this uh, challenge of, uh, you know, sea level rise projections, both at the global level and at the regional level. And, uh, you know, we, we all have seen that uh, over the years, the projections have kind of, um, you know, varied a lot. And even now the range of projections for sea level is quite a bit. And now the new climate models that are being used in the IPCC uh, 6th assessment report. There are also some outlier cases which are projecting some high levels of sea level rise. And in this case, the model projections and the satellite based observations obviously go hand in hand uh, in improving our uh, projections. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this and also how, where is the bottleneck right now? Is the bottleneck in the uh, satellite measurements or is the bottleneck in our understanding of the climate models? And uh, in that context, what what role will the satellite measurements have in the future uh, in improving the sea level rise projections because of the high uh, socioeconomic risks that come with the uh, with sea level rise? So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah there is a challenge. Why there is a, no challenge as I told in the uh, altimetry because sea level is only the altimetry. You can get the overall uh, pattern. One, when you want to talk about the regional as well as global uh, region also we are able to do uh, regional uh, sea level rise also we are able to monitor it only thing one way is people project it they project it a uh, different way uh, modeling wise also somebody assume that uh, suppose three meter per, uh, per year is increasing what person will do near the coast he will take it three meter three millimeter in the 10 years uh, three centimeter and put at the, this whole area will be inundated that is not the truth actually, because when you are assuming anything is sea level is rising everywhere it is not rising the same because uh, different uh, components of sea level also thermal component is also there, steric component is there. So that also has to be taken into account when you are really modeling it is that uh, uh, highly ac ac accuracy. So those people, many people are not doing that. That type of research is required. We have to take a particular region. Then you have to understand that region once uh, this uh, uh, rise of the sea level. And another important thing is force. Because when a uh, sea level is rising, uh, when you might have seen any near the coast, their forces are there, waves are there, the circulation is there. Because that is your coast itself is changing. And many times uh, in the time frame of the climate uh, scale, these they are automatically adopted. So that also not being taken care when uh, somebody Somebody just to take it, the uh, sea level is rising and uh, put it in the model or maybe the in the map. It, this will happen. In the, so those things are required when we are really talking about the sea level 
in the uh, longer time span, 10 years, 50 years, or 100 years. In that uh, particular region, global sea level, you can say, kilometer per year is increasing, that's fine. But this area will be inundated, this area will be drowned. It is not truth as such, uh, you cannot take it just like that. Great, thank you very much, sir. Uh, and I also had another question, uh, if I may. Uh, and the this was related to the uh, measurement of, uh, you mentioned the draft blue economy policy and uh, how one of the segments of that is the accounting of the blue economy. And uh, one of the parts in that would be the accounting of the ecosystem services, which you also mentioned the, uh, you know, the coverage area of mangroves and other types of uh, coral reefs and such. So I was wondering how, accurate are these uh, you know measurements and whether this itself is enough to uh, account for the ecosystem services uh, and what is the resolution of this because you know there are many subtleties in that like we have done uh, some research on this in the context of mangroves and we know that there are different types of mangrove forests like the dense the medium and the open type uh, forests and so all of them have different you know, levels in which they contribute to the uh, uh, to the ecosystem, yeah, the, the broader ecosystem. So what is the role of satellite measurements in this and what is the accuracy and the resolution of the measurements in this case? And just before you answer, Dr. Rajkumar, if I might be so bold as to uh, butt in and buttress this, you know, uh, there is a real problem here because we are finding vast differential uh, between the government's data of mangrove cover in, in certain areas based upon satellite coverage and the real uh, on the ground cover where the ground people are saying that A, the, the, the mangroves are not uh, dense, the mangroves are sparse, they are, they are baby mangroves and none of all this can be obviously measured from, uh, from satellite. So government is, uh, we fear, is perhaps either obtaining or disseminating information from only one source and is indicating actually that there is an increase in mangrove cover all over India based on satellite uh, data. Whereas on the ground field researchers are saying there is a sharp decrease. So that's where the problem really lies. I understand. This is uh, happening in actually, yeah, yeah in the forest, uh, or many places, uh, forest area also. Uh, the reason is uh, whatever we want to do in very very high resolution scale we can do from satellite there is no challenge as such or uh, accuracy is not a problem only problem comes repetitivity if you are talking about the resolution of the five meter or one meter like that you cannot have the daily or monthly scale because that is too costly uh, proportion so so from satellite point of view what is being done you have the maybe monthly scale or maybe the annual scale changes you can do only if very high decision. These people want to do uh, for our validation also what we do, uh, we go for the uh, satellite data validation, certain places, different type of uh, homogeneous place we take, uh, maybe five or six type, and then correlate with the satellite data. So that much errors are there. We cannot go and say exactly it is uh, very sparse or like that. He says very sparse, sparse or uh, uh, too much uh, uh, mangroves are there, like that type of classification we do. Based on that, we derive our uh, methodology and then uh, classify it. So those type of errors are in satellite data point of view. But in the, uh, uh, what we call it, uh, ground tooth, ground tooth also many places may not be there. Based on the, some, some places, ground tooth is there. So those places, uh, actually, uh, there will be uh, no error, uh, I think. So they may be actually extending it to everywhere. That is that is a problem. Uh, Sometimes, as I told in CW, this place also, based on the one data, uh, people try to extend to the other regions, which may not be true. There you need the actual uh, people with the knowledge of that place, region, as well as the technology. Because each technology directly classification, like any particular uh, statistical technique, you cannot apply each and everywhere. So there, there actually we have a, uh, what we said, uh, difference of opinion between. Yeah, it's quite true. And also there, there is uh, something to be said about human bias of ground truth measurements. That means, you know, if the ground truth is being measured by people who are predisposed towards saying that there is a, dis you know, a reduction of a, or a disaster in the offing, then they will tend to extrapolate, as you rightly said, alarmist data. Uh, and since they are ground truth measurers, 
uh, it's difficult for us to, uh, you know, um, it's just yes. a factor that also needs to be taken into account. Okay, so we now have a question from uh, uh, Commander Saurav Mahanti. And once again, if I may uh, I'll, uh, ask the moderator if he could unmute sort of your mic and you can ask the question directly. Okay. Uh, Gram, sir, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, sir, my question was regarding the uh, Navic constellation. So I believe that uh, these operate or receive signal on the L5 and S band. So these are uh, quite different from uh, the signals which are uh, received by the other GMS system. So now whatever receivers we have, uh, these will most probably will not be compatible. So uh, what is uh, my question is in order to ensure wide commercial use of Navic. Now either they will have to uh, procure separate uh, receivers. So uh, my question is, how uh, is ISRO trying to sort out this issue? And are there plans to increase the number of satellites? I believe there are about seven. And so that uh, we can increase our uh, coverage further. Sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, uh, the, both the things are being tried. As anyhow, the number of satellites are being uh, developed and the sensors are being developed and these will be launched. That is one thing from the satellite point of view. Other thing commercial also, you might have heard that uh, we are trying to have that uh, more. The reason is uh, uh, any company will not uh, immediately adopt it. So some uh, like mobile companies are trying to adopt it. Uh, this for commercial use and slowly it will come because when the more satellites are there, uh, then uh, people will be started using it. And uh, presently they are using only the GNSS uh, system. But uh, in some of the system, Navic is started coming. So it, it will take time because a change of technology takes time. But it will happen because the government side also and our side also, uh, we are insisting that Navic system should be there, like for fishermen and all those uh, area. Those are using, uh, uh, those. but in the normal mobile, it, it it may take some time so that it can be immediately can be taken over. Thank you, sir. No, you are muted. Uh, muted. Sorry, thank you, uh, Dr. Ravindra and uh, Dr. Rajkumar. And now your colleague, Dr. Ravindra, has a question about how accurately can the satellite snow cover maps be used to calculate the fraction of the uh, snow cover to contribution in the water cycle, uh, which is not uh, precisely the same as what we might have asked about the increase of sea level. But he's talking about the precipitation cycle having been changed by climate. Uh, and so what is the correlation that we can develop between the uh, satellite snow cover maps and the precipitation cycle? Uh, have I got that right, uh, Dr. Ravindra? No, sir, there is a slight difference in that. Actually, there's a controversy that the because of the global warming, glaciers are receding and our rivers will go dry. But actually, the, the people say that the contribution of glacier is not that much as of the snow cover. So I wanted to know from Dr. Rajkumar, can our snow cover maps really tell us how much is the fraction of the contribution of snow melt as compared to the glaciers from the maps? Okay, uh, yeah, but well, snow cover, uh, uh, when we are talking about the snow cover overall, uh, we are uh, not doing as, as such. Uh, over only for Himalayan uh, region, we are doing the snow cover uh, mapping uh, regularly, very regularly uh, using the AWIPS data. 56 meter. This is regularly being done. The snow cover uh, wise, uh, we are doing and glacier uh, monitoring uh, as uh, uh, many times we have discussed also. There are uh, uh, it is receding, but uh, scale what we normally talk about it depends upon the how you are uh, doing it and by which data you are, you are doing it. Because many studies uh, come in the nature also as uh, some of the uh, prestigious uh, papers also. There are many methods are there uh, based on the Gravity, then there's a mass uh, based is their uh, equation or the other way. So uh, people are trying to do it, but uh, whatever our study had shown uh, uh, recently, also our uh, people in the space application were uh, doing that uh, compilation of all these study. Long term, if you see, yeah, glaciers are uh, melting. It's not that they are not melting, but uh, scale people say in certain time, it uh, uh, if you are measuring, it was a uh, uh, very uh, uh, 
high is rate of melting was there then it was uh, uh, after what it was not that much so the total uh, period where when you uh, it depends upon the how how much period you are taking and then uh, based on that how you make your publications uh, if you take only five or ten years, uh, you can see recently five years, ten years. You can see suddenly it is a very large uh, gradient will be there. But if you have long term data, you'll see that very slow changes are there. That is regularly it is happening. Uh, that is uh, not uh, any I think uh, doubt that it's not happening. But uh, the, which is scale uh, you have to see and which area because some areas are melting uh, with a uh, larger uh, gradient and some area are stable. So if it is actually uh, how to say it about is uh, overall because you cannot say general any statement about these things uh, whether it is uh, melting with very uh, fast or uh, not melting at all uh, a satellite based information it is showing that it is it is being it, it is done it is it is being it is melting okay sir thank you thank you uh, you know the the recent uh, uh, glacial lake outburst flood which took place uh, is a manifestation of just this in the trans Himalayan area. And there are huge geopolitical uh, implications of that because, you know, Nepal, et cetera, have got such fragile political systems at the moment that uh, a major disaster there could impact everybody. So these are all really good uh, areas of uh, examination. And, uh, and uh, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, so uh, we, the next question is from uh, Subir Datta, who wants to know uh, you know, when we spoke about um, in the beginning, when I spoke about OceanSat 2 and OceanSat 3, incidentally, I also read that there's something called OceanSat 3 Alpha, which you can uh, either dismiss or mention in the in the passing. Uh, but uh, he wants to know whether this remote sensing capability that we have includes the ability to uh, uh, look at fishing and fishing activity, not just potential fishing zones, but actual activity that is taking place whether that can be used then to uh, amalgamate with other um, AIS-based data of maritime domain awareness sharing to be able to include illegal shipping, Ill I mean, illegal fishing, uh, the dark shipping or shipping which is uh, not following standard practices, uh, mar marine exploration, piracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are all related to security, not necessarily directly military security. And he, uh, he, of course, also says that this will require the ground truth versus uh, remote sensing uh, data comparisons. So uh, would you like to comment upon that uh, as well? Yeah, uh, sorry, actually, I could not understand the, uh, fully the question, but uh, uh, what uh, I understood that you were presently for the uh, fishing zone, uh, PFZ, uh, it is being done, but actually knowing that where the fishing is being done, uh, whether that can be monitored or not, is that is a question of. Uh, that, is, that is absolutely right. And there's another question, which is, of course, attendant to this, and you might be able to address that. And that is that as the uh, remote sensing satellites of any kind uh, go around, you know, the, one of the problems in trying to get real time data uh, is, of course, repetitivity of the um, of the uh, sensor, but also whether there are enough ground stations to capture the to capture the data unless it is going from one satellite to another in a data relay fashion so are we currently relying upon uh, data relay stations satellite to satellite until it comes to a position from where the geo uh, geostationary satellite might be able to download or downlink the data or are we having to wait until the satellite orbit once again coincides with the footprint of a ground station. But we can talk about yeah, that uh, are, by and by. Let me yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, presently we are not talking about that. We are not having that uh, that type of system, uh, relay system, uh, IDRS type of system. So presently we are having only the ground station based. So uh, that is the limitation. So whenever the satellite is passing over a uh, ground station, then only whatever the data in 90 minutes or like that uh, we are able to do so that that much uh, delay is there and processing also anyhow afterwards comes the processing so it is not uh, that uh, near real time what we call it is uh, not there so this is something that i wanted you to uh, state because very many of our scholars uh, they seem to be alarmist about even chinese uh, satellites you know rendering the whole indian ocean uh, 
uh, transparent and I keep trying to tell them that satellites need ground stations and ground stations need ground. So where is the Chinese ground? But anyway, that's a different question. And let me go to the next uh, question from uh, uh, Dr. Srivastav, uh, uh, Commandant Srivastav, who says, uh, how effectively can we detect and track uh, leakages, oil spills from uh, offshore oil wells? And if can that data be shared on a real time basis, the latter real time basis we have already covered just now. So uh, I think that uh, you might like to just uh, address the issue of whether we can detect and track uh, offshore oil spill uh, utilizing uh, our satellite remote sensing yes. capability. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, absolutely it can be done and it is being done also that oil slicks uh, are being uh, done uh, very effectively from the satellite data. Uh, both the types. Uh, one is the optical data also. Many all six can be seen, and another by the micro that uh, synthetic composite radar data. So it is being done regularly. Uh, but only thing as I told uh, near real time is the uh, only problem. But otherwise is being done. And in addition to that, what we also do uh, that uh, uh, I was showing in one of the slides, uh, the track of this, uh, how it, it will be, where it will be going, all six because that is also important. If all leak is happening someplace uh, where it will will be going the next day or like that. So that type of uh, thing also based on the modeling, like engine based model, what you call it. That also we are doing. Thank you, sir. I just wanted to know, sir, if there is uh, this, uh, especially from the Bombay High and uh, other fields, they are having certain issues of uh, oil leakages, where in which uh, for about last a decade or so, there is a study going on. And they say that ki the uh, tar ball formations which are taking place at Goa as well as Nagarod in Gujarat, sir. Uh, it is because of that. And we are actually not uh, leading to any kind of conclusion on that till date. Uh, that actually some studies being done, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, by the Space Application Center as and the National Institute of Oceanography. Together, they are, they are doing such study. Because I remember one uh, project was there, uh, what we call it, Samudra project, under uh, NIU and SAC, we are doing this study. Sir, my question is if we are able to detect the images yeah. from the oil wells, even on the monthly basis, if we can maintain a data. And as Sir is saying rightly, that we can also monitor the track. Yeah. So then I think that will actually help the study to come to a conclusion as early as possible. But we are yeah. unable to do that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody says somebody has to, uh, uh, first thing is uh, your satellite should be there at particular place. Uh, that uh, reason is uh, everywhere you are on the optical sensor, you're not collecting data each and every place. But I'm uh, uh, talking about the, because it's going, it's a, it's a decade ago problem which is going on, sir, the, and the quantity which is getting accumulated uh, over the beaches at Nagarol as well as Goa, it is huge quantity. However, it gets um, washed up with the uh, vagaries of the weather. But definitely, for timing, it becomes an issue as well as uh, media also takes care of it in a very well manner to project it for the I mean, benefit of the general benefit of the um, audience, I mean, population or for uh, uh, the, so, the we'll government, is, whatever it may. Ravindra, what we'll do is we'll ask you to continue the uh, clarifications uh, offline because we do have a few more questions and we would like to go through those. Right, sir. Right, sir. Thank you. I apologize for cutting you short a little bit. Uh, so there are a set of questions from uh, uh, from Commodore Dr. Rana. And uh, he uh, asks uh, in one case, how are you using uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning techniques to uh, enhance the effectiveness of the data that you are generating is his first question. And uh, secondly, of course, uh, he asks for the, the any names of uh, the international collaborations that you have with other international agencies. This, I think, is available quite freely on the internet, uh, utilizing your own site. So I'd, I'd rather think that perhaps uh, Commodore Rana can look at that. But the first question in terms of AI and machine learning and deep learning, you may want to uh, elaborate. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, AI and uh, machine learning, we are using a lot nowadays. Uh, I think maybe some uh, three years or four years back, uh, it, it, uh, earlier people were doing, but in the ISRO, 
uh, this is the uh, one of the major thing we are taking but mainly uh, for the different data purpose one is the classification purpose application purpose also use you know, and data processing also uh, we are using a lot now so this is the thing uh, it is uh, being used thank and you very developing much. developing also ai techniques our uh, some of the colleagues are, are developing not only using but they are developing techniques also ai techniques for that uh, they are only using uh, does that answer uh, the questions that you had, Dr. Anand? Uh, yes, yes, uh, I'm sure uh, definitely because with everyone nowadays uh, uh, getting onto this bandwagon, I'm sure, and especially with the agencies like NRSC who have got large amount of data, will definitely clear. My another question was uh, the sensors that you mentioned, are they uh, developed in-house or you are importing them or how, how is it? No, sensors are being developed in house, whatever sensors I talked about. But some components okay. are coming, some components because each and every component we, we don't have here. Some com components are coming, yeah. but sensors are being developed. All right, thank you. In fact, ISRO's, uh, ISRO's capability and capacities in this regard are matters of international acclaim that ISRO is developing very, very advanced sensor uh, packages, uh, util you know, in house, in indigenously. Naturally, uh, as you rightly say, not all components of anybody's are all indigenous, including the most advanced countries like NASA itself. Uh, not countries, but agencies. Okay, there's one more question from uh, Dr. Pooja Bhatt, and uh, her question really uh, relates to the utilization of the role and scope, as well as the accuracy of remote sensing in the field of uh, oil and mineral explorations in the high seas. Now, presumably, I'm not sure, so Pooja will have to inter intervene, but I presume that by high seas, she means in areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, because otherwise we're talking about exclusive economic zone where you have already covered a great deal. So in area beyond national jurisdiction, then we are going to be talking about deep sea mining uh, in uh, ABNJ uh, and, and uh, ABNJ issues. So would you like to take a stab at answering that? Dr. Uh, uh, I'm not very sure, but uh, uh, mineral exploration and the oil, uh, is, uh, no, sorry, uh, in the offshore, we are not uh, going ahead. Uh, but that, that, that is a different, as I told, this is this topic I have itself. I, don't, uh, I uh, certainly don't no, no, know that somebody you're, is studying. Right. But Pooja is from, one yeah, of the Pooja is a satellite. Yeah. Mineral sorry, exploration sorry, is, is difficult because uh, as a, it is a uh, much uh, below the uh, at the bottom of that. Uh, so based on the gravity, only these things can be done. And uh, as I told, uh, based on gravity, uh, earlier some uh, studies were done. This like uh, what we call it, sea mount. So sea mount depends upon the this gravity and uh, sea mount type of thing you can uh, detect from the altimeter and uh, corroborating with the other data. It can be tried. What I am. Uh, uh, I'm not aware, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, no, you're quite right. In fact, you are you are just being diplomatically correct. Uh, the truth is, uh, Pooja, that uh, you know, remote sensing will utilize either optical uh, instrumentation or uh, or electromagnetic in, in instrumentation, and neither of those two um, uh, can penetrate deep waters. So you can get something on the surface gravity. Uh, Measurements, on the other hand, might be able to indicate the presence uh, of an, an anomalous uh, degree of gravity, which may then indicate the presence of minerals or even sea mounts or any any such thing. So uh, I think we're done with the uh, question and uh, questions, and you have answered all of them uh, with uh, commendable elan and uh, accuracy. So thank you very much once again, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, it has been a totally enlightening experience, not only your lecture, not only the slides, but the wealth of information that you've provided both during the lecture as well as during the Q&A. So let me with uh, now hand over the proceedings back to a rather impatient looking uh, Mr. Satyam. Satyam, over to you. Thank you, sir, for moderating the audience interaction. We are out of time, but. Uh, it's the realization which did not dawn upon me because the instruction was uh, the discussion was so intriguing and and something that uh, we have there's so many things that they are new in this discussion so we all were looking at it with a lot of intrigue and interest 
Uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you will agree that it has been an absorbing session. So before uh, we move to the next segment, which is we will be drawing the EPL to a close, I want to request Admiral Sunil Lamba, the chairman of the National Maritime Foundation and former chief of the Indian uh, Naval Staff to share his view and impression with us. Admiral Lamba, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Satyam. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar, uh, Director NRSC, and the hallmark of a true domain expert is his or her ability to take an extremely complex and a highly technical subject and present it in a simple manner, which all of us can understand, but without dumbing down the content. And this is what Dr. Rajkumar has done with such skill and efficiency. And on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you very much. We've been given an expose on what ISRO is doing in the field of socioeconomic security, sustainable development, disaster risk reduction, and remote sensing. I think most of you will agree that our quality of weather forecast has gone up by leaps and bounds and the accuracy of our predictions of cyclones is there for all of us to see. And more often than not, I myself quite often go on to the India Met Department site and go and see the INSAT satellite picture and make my own prediction, especially during the monsoon, whether we're going to have rain or not and where the Western disturbance is. So the accuracy of data predictions have gone up. The availability of data to help government to take decisions on all these fields which we highlighted is there for us to see on a daily basis. Like, uh, say, if you look at the agriculture sector, the, the estimate of how much acreage has been planted in a particular season and what is likely going to be the food output is all based on data which has been provided by ISRO. And I think ISRO is one organization which is, has a great feather in its cap for the nation and for the government of India. And we in the Ministry of Defense in the Navy we always used to say when ISRO can do it, why can't DRDO do the same thing? This discussion takes place because in all segment of the technology of the space segment, whether it is a launch vehicle, whether it's a cryogenic engine, whether it's sensors, ISRO is there where the world is. And they are competitive cost-wise in providing launch services, and more and more nations are coming to us and coming to ISRO to put their satellites in space. This is a great service which ISRO is doing to the nation and to the world at large. There has been a great deal of interaction between the three defense services and ISRO to provide satellite based services. And uh, remote sensing data and imagery available uh, to the three services is cutting edge. Quality of the images and resolutions have gone up by year to year. And finally, timely information being available. I entirely agree with what Rajkumar, Dr. Rajkumar said. You may not have it instantly available, but the time late is hardly anything. Uh, the Navy has worked very closely with the ISRO, and uh, there has been a sea change in naval operations in the form of MET data available for ships at sea. And most, ex most importantly is in communications. Uh, Navy and ISRO work jointly together to launch the naval satellite Rukmani, and it has made a sea change in the way the Navy operates. Now all units, all platforms that see ashore are linked through the Rukmani satellites, and the three services have worked together and gone ahead with the next decade. What is the requirement of different satellites in which segment, whether it's remote sense? communication, whether it is for navigation aids, this plan is there and the launch schedules have been worked out and is there and I'm quite, I'm sure it has been approved at the moment. A number of questions were raised on coastal security issues. Uh, 
the Navy, Coast Guard, and ISRO have worked together to provide uh, AIS-based transponders for fishing boats, and that has been worked out. Um, a pilot study was done in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, and now it is for the government of India and the state government to ensure that these transponders are fitted in each and every Indian fishing boat. So you will be able to make out friend and foe and have this data available for maritime domain awareness in our center, which is there in Gurgaon and this thing. So in the end, I'd like to compliment Dr. Rajkumar for giving us an in-depth uh, expose on what ISRO is doing in all the segments. And it's an organization which we can all be very proud of. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rajkumar, and wish you all the very best and ISRO all the very best in all your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed what I asked, talking to you, all of you. It was good question answer session discussions. Well, uh, thank you, Admiral Lamba, for your closing remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you had a good learning experience today. Before we leave, let me. Um, Admiral Chauhan, are you trying to say something? Okay. Uh, before we leave, uh, as I said, let me thank all of you for taking the trouble and time to be with us for this webinar. And I want to once again place and record our sincere and heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Rajkumar for the effort which he has devoted for today's EPL. I would like to make an important announcement on 27th, 28th, and 29th of October this year. The Indian Navy will hold its apex strategic level international conference, namely the IPRD or the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue. And as always, the National Maritime Foundation is honored and proud to be Navy's knowledge partner and the chief organizer of this event. Now, in view of the COVID induced restriction on travel, please note that this year's conference will be held entirely online. So please block these dates and watch out for the notification, which would be sent to you very soon. Do not forget to subscribe to our website, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook to receive regular updates of NMF, NMF's uh, events and publication. So see you next time. Please take good care. Good afternoon and Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, take good care. Bye bye. And we'll catch you shortly, Dr. Rajkumar. You're not uh, you're not going to be able to shake us off quite so easily. So we will be like a barnacle on your ship's hull. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Steve and Oliver.